Who likes the new bumper video? Got some jams going this morning. <laughs> That's pretty good. My name is Thomas. If we've never met, uh, I get to be on staff here at Calvary and open up the God, God's Word on the weekends with us. And today we're going to start a new series that's actually going to take us all the way to Easter, entitled Questions Jesus Asked. Questions are a wonderful thing. They're, they're so much more helpful than accusations or statements. Questions are designed to actually cause a discussion to happen so that we would actually be able to have discoveries of what's going on inside of us, that we'd have the ability to make new decisions, evaluate how we have been living, and perhaps change that for the betterment of ourselves, families, our communities. And so questions are asked by people who really care for us. Some of the best people who ask questions are like good counselors. What's going on with you? What's going on in your marriage? Tell me, why does this cause you to be angry? Why does this cause you to be afraid? Doctors ask really good questions when we're injured. How does this feel? When did this start? What activities cause more inflammation of this? Because they care about us and want us to be healthy. Jesus asked the best questions. Jesus was asked more than 180 questions. He answered about eight of them as they're recorded in the scriptures. He asked more than 300 questions to the people that were around him, crowds that had come to listen to him, his disciples that were nearby. His questions are not because he doesn't know the answer, but that he's curious about us so that we would be able to not feel threatened, but that we would actually engage in a discussion with God so that we would actually be able to sense what's going on in us, what's going on in our lives. Why do we think this way? Why do we feel this way? How have we been living? And are there new habits or adjustments that we need to make? The question that we're going to start the series with is a question that Jesus asked during the Sermon on the Mount. Why are you anxious? I can see you're, you're troubled and you're worried about the uncertainties of tomorrow. Why are you anxious? To which we would reply, why are you not anxious? I mean, do you not live in the world that I live in? In fact, Jesus, some of the statements you made make me anxious. You said you're going to send us out like sheep amongst wolves. That produces some anxiety in me. You told me that no servant's greater than the master. If the world hated me, they're, they're going to hate you. That causes me some concern. You told me that the days between your first coming and second coming would be marked by wars and rumors of wars, of famines, natural disasters, diseases, and death. And you guaranteed that in this world we will have trouble. That causes my anxiety to rise. The things that you have said and the world that we live in, how can you not be anxious? And today, it's very interesting because we live in a cultural moment in which the air we breathe is the air of angst. Our popular media, our social platforms, they breed anxiety. And so you can just fill in the blank on any news headline. Basically, every news headline is this. Here's something you didn't know about five seconds ago and why you should be concerned. He, do you know who Jimmy Johnson is? And do you know what he could do to your life? Like, I didn't know who that person was, and now I'm worried. What's the feds doing with an interest rate? And why you should be worried. What is an interest rate? And why you should be concerned. And then just fill in the blank headlines. Here's something you didn't know about five seconds ago, and why you should be really bothered by it. Now, why do certain kingdoms, we'll call them kingdoms, want to keep their subjects in a state of angst? is if a kingdom can keep their subjects in a state of anxiety, fear, worry, trouble, what do they also keep is their attention. They've captured their attention and often, maybe this is too strong of a word, can control their behavior. Here's what's amazing. God has no desire for his people to live in a state of angst. What a beautiful king. Unlike the kings of the world, that want its people to live in a state of uncertainty, worry, anxiety, and fear. Your God does not want you to live there, does not want you to breathe that air. And, and we breathe that air because it's just where we are in life. In fact, many people 
wear anxiety as a badge. Now, there have been cultural moments in our history in which we have worn badges to try to prove to people that we're not something. Let me describe this. It's very interesting. Past generations have have worn the cultural badge of not showing emotion, keeping a stiff upper lip, not being bothered by life. And so they are emotionally disconnected from us. Maybe some of us can think of our fathers or grandfathers or grandparents. Now, why is that? Because if, if they would show emotion, they would seem what? Weak. And so the badge they wear is, I will not let you see how I'm feeling, how I'm doing, so that you won't think I'm weak. It's a bad badge to wear. It causes harm. Another badge that's been popular in the last 30 years is the badge of busyness. You sit down with someone, how you doing? Oh, so busy. Even if they're not busy, that's just the right answer. I'm exhausted, schedule, it's crazy, the kids, the work, whatever, I'm so busy because if I'm not busy, what am I? Lazy. I don't want to appear lazy, and so the auto answer is I'm busy. Now, what is it with anxiety? It's a cultural badge that's being worn right now. Someone says, are you anxious about China, about the oil reserves, about war, about your health, about your retirement? And you say no. They say, you're not anxious. Do you not care. There it is. You know it. Somehow my anxiety about something proves my care about something. Are those equals? No, they're not. And so we can actually reduce our anxiety and increase our care. I don't have to prove to the world or people around that I care about them or about the concerns of the world through anxiety. And so those who are even younger in this room, high schoolers, this is really important to know. You are breathing the air of an anxious world to try to prove that you care. The Lord doesn't want that for you. That'll, that'll kill your soul. And so the Lord has for us a different remedy of how we address the cares and concerns of the world, that we would actually live free, free of them. And it's going to come down to three things in today's text. It's going to come down to who do you trust, what do you treasure, and what do you think about tomorrow? Let's read our text. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. As you're going there, a question that can be asked is, Is anxiety sin? C.S. Lewis responded to that in a letter to Malcolm where he writes, some people feel guilty about their anxieties and regard them as a defect of faith. Lewis says, I do not agree. They are afflictions, not sin. And like all afflictions, they are, if we can so take them, our share in the passion of Christ. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was deeply troubled in his soul, even sweating droplets of blood. Paul says, of all the dangers that have afflicted me, my anxiousness comes from thinking about the church, how the church is doing, the people of the church. And so anxiety is not simply a sin. It is an affliction. It is common to all of us as human beings. And it is to be brought and entrusted to the Lord. Here's what Jesus says in the Sermon of the Mount. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his life, to a span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. 
Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So here's Jesus, God himself, telling his people, I don't want you to be anxious. I don't want anxiety and worry to be in your life. What what is really anxiety? What is worry? Anxiety comes when there is something that we value in a perceived or real way that's being threatened, and we feel too small or weak or out of control to guard it. Anxiety produces in us when something we value is threatened by something bigger or stronger in which we feel too small or weak to control it. And so anxiety produces up. And and the anxiety that we see here just mentioned is you're anxious about what to wear, what to eat, what to drink. Now, in the first century, that's a real question because they don't know what to wear or what, what they will wear in the future, if there is food for tomorrow, what they will be able to drink tomorrow. That is not our present concern in the first century. Most of us in this room have food stocked in pantries, have all of our things insured, have our closets filled with clothes. Many people in this room walk into their closet room to see all of their clothes. And so the question in the first century might be, what will we eat because we don't know where food's coming from? Or what will we wear because we don't have enough clothing for the season ahead? But the questions that we ask today of what will we eat is, what will we eat? Mexican? I had that last night. Chinese maybe? Perhaps. What will we wear? Well, I can't wear that. I wore that like two weeks ago. If he sees me in that or she sees me in that, it's so embarrassing. I need a new outfit or that outfit doesn't go with the occasion. And so what we will eat and what we will wear is a totally different paradigm, which means there's a heart issue here. And it goes up to the text right before this. This is the first remedy of who do you trust? That's what we're getting after is a question of trust. And if you look at chapter six, starting in verse 25, we we want you to know how to read your Bibles here at Calvary. There's a word that began this section that we read. It says, therefore, Now, if you've been around Calvary long enough, when you run into a therefore in the Bible, what's the question that you ask? What's the therefore, therefore? Meaning this therefore concludes a section. It's the result of an argument or or a conversation that's been happening. And so when you see, therefore, I tell you not to be anxious, well, what was he just talking about? Well, he was just talking about an issue of trust. Who's your master? Who are you trusting to resolve anxieties? And so verse 24 says, no one can serve two masters. You have to choose who's going to be the master of your life. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You have to choose. Who do you think is best to resolve your worry, anxieties, and trouble in the world? Money, financial resources, financial provisions, financial securities, or God. Now, there's something in us that wants to say, money. Like, come on. I mean, seriously, I don't have a problem right now that I can't, that's a financial problem that I don't think money can't solve. I can make a little bit more money. If I had a little bit more money, if I had a little bit more of whatever, I would have less anxiety. The amazing thing is the world has found out that's absolutely not true. Back in 2017, the World World Health Organization did a national survey of more than 150,000 participants in more than 26 countries, of countries that were in poverty and those countries that were in wealth. And they were asking the question about people's anxieties. And what they discovered is that the countries of greatest wealth had the greatest anxieties. And not by a small margin, by an astronomically large margin. So the poorest countries like Nigeria had a 0.01% population that were anxious. And then you looked at the three richest countries, which was Australia, New Zealand, and the United States, 
and the anxiety was 7% over 8% of the population. Eight times the amount of many countries. And then you look at the countries that had low percentages of anxiety, like a third of the anxiety or a quarter of the anxiety that we as Americans have. And you're talking about places like Israel. Would you be anxious if you were in Israel right now? They have less anxiety than you. <laughs> Ukraine. Would you, be, would you be anxious if you were in Ukraine right now? They have less anxiety than you. What does that mean? Oh, we, we have trusted the wrong master. Money's a cruel master when it comes to anxiety. It does not cure it. It enables it. It produces more of it. And so what he's telling his disciples right off the bat is, choose your master. Who are you hoping to, to reduce worry and trouble in your life? You gotta choose money, material wealth, goods and services, or God himself. And so what we can say is the first century, they didn't know where food was coming from. They weren't certain about their clothing. And we as the first, now we as the 21st century are looking at this going, man, those aren't any of our questions. And we are far more anxious than they, which means it's a heart issue about who do you trust? That's the first thing. Who do you trust? The source of your trust, either money or God, will produce or reduce anxieties. Now, the reason God reduces anxiety is because of who God is. If God was a cruel master, just another king that we've experienced that wants to keep his subjects in a state of anxiety, to keep them in their attention and obedience, he would be a cruel master too. But that's not who he is. When we read this text here in chapter 6, throughout the whole chapter, specifically in what we read, he is a benevolent heavenly father. And he reveals how, how integral he is in our lives by talking about birds and flowers. He says, okay, consider, like just, just think about, can you imagine, can you picture birds and, and lilies? Like, look at those lilies. Have you ever made something as beautiful as that? That's gorgeous. Look at that bird who's just living carefree on a branch, eating breakfast. And what he says is, that bird got a meal because your heavenly father fed him. And that flower is adorned with all that beauty, is dressed that way, because your heavenly father adorned it. Which debunks this idea that God has somehow created an ecological system that feeds and clothes itself, and then he stepped away from it like, go for it, it can, it'll continue on. No, what God wants you to see is that he is a benevolent heavenly father, intimately involved, actively involved, actively present with feeding birds and clothing lilies. And then he says, look at the birds and look at the lilies and think about yourself, consider yourself. Are you not more valuable to your heavenly father than these? Like you're children of God with an eternal inheritance. He gave up his son on a cross for you. Are you not more valuable and so if this is how he gives concern to feeding birds and clothing lilies, what do you think he's going to do in your life? And so one of the things that we need from this passage is eyes to see the presence and activity of God with us. That God is the one who provides for all of our needs. This is why around mealtime you gather and you give thanks to the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for providing this meal. It's the Lord's provision in your life that we attribute the meal to. It's God's activity in our life, for he is the one that we trust. There's an odd story in 2 Kings chapter 6. Story of a prophet named Elisha, and there's a country, Syria, that is going to wage war against Israel. The problem is the prophet keeps getting in the way. And so the Syrian leadership says, we got to go get Elisha to find out where he is, and we're going to send a whole bunch of troops to capture him so that then we can assault Israel and defeat Israel. So they find out that, that he's in a city called Dothan. So they send all kinds of troops at night and they circle the whole city. And Elisha's servant comes out in the morning and sees the warriors at his doorstep. And he freaks out, just like we probably would. This is what it says in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15. I'll read, then we'll hop up on the screen. 
When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, alas, my master, what shall we do? What are we going to do about this? There's two of us, hundreds of them. And Elisha's not worried. He doesn't have any anxiety. This is what he says. 16, do not be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, Oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. The Lord's army was with him. He just didn't have eyes to see it. He couldn't imagine it. And so what it does, it reduces his fear for he sees God's presence with him. It's like my friend Rod said, anxiety is not reduced by the absence of something, but the presence of someone. And that someone is your heavenly father. Who? Consider it. Every time you saw a bird fed, it was the activity of God. And when you saw the lilies clothed, that's the activity of God. And, and can you see the fingerprints of God in your life? I know I've lived in seasons of anxiety with newborn kids, of early days in marriage, of being between jobs, of uncertainty of finances. And looking back in the rearview mirror, you just see the fingerprints of God all over it. Oh, he, he took care of all of that. And surely he will take care of what's next. And so the very first thing is, who do you trust? Money. I know it's easy to trust money. Or God. If money's the master... Anxiety will increase. Everything in our social science says so. If God is the master, then there's the possibility, this is his invitation, that you could live as carefree as the birds. As carefree as the lilies. Now, does that mean bad things don't happen to birds and lilies? No, birds get sacrificed and lilies get burned. But your heavenly father provides for all of their needs in all of their days. Which leads to the second question about what do you treasure? Remember, anxiety is when something we value, something we treasure is threatened in a real or perceived way, and we feel too small or too weak to control it. And so what is it that you treasure? Well, Matthew 6 is a whole conversation about what you treasure. Like, what is it that you're hoping to get a, re or who are you hoping to get a reward from? And so chapter six opens up with, beware of practicing your righteousness. This is like your religious behaviors before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your father who is in heaven. Remember, we trust our father who's in heaven. He says, look at how you practice your faith in front of people. What's the reward that these religious people are trying to get? When you practice your faith and so to display how religious you are for people's what? Approval. People's opinion of you. This is what they're wrapped up in. Their treasure, their reward in their practices is that people's opinions of them would be great. What people think about them, people's praises of them. This is the whole chapter. Verse two, thus when you give to the needy, like when you're, when you're caring for the poor, don't sound any trumpet before you as the hypocrites in the synagogues do and in the streets that they may be praised by others. What's the reward? Is the people's praises. That's what they treasure. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward, what they treasure. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your father, right, remember, our God, who sees in secret will reward you. What do you treasure, the praises and rewards of people or of your heavenly Father? Again, this is about prayers. When you pray, you must not look like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in synagogues and the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you that you have received, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. One more, when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others. 
but by your Father. Remember, our Father in heaven, that's who we're trusting, who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And so if what we treasure is other people's opinion, other people's praises, other people's evaluation of us, do you think we'll be anxious or not? How secure are other people's opinions of you? Man, they're fickle, aren't they? You do one misstep, and people's opinions of you will change for the rest of their life. Do you think that will produce more or less anxiety if your treasure in your practices is wrapped up in people's opinions of you? You see, the principle can be applied further than that is, what is it that you treasure? These people treasured the opinions and praises of others. Like walking into a room, what do these people think about me? I'm at a new birthday party. Are they going to like the gifts that I brought? Maybe I brought something that's not expensive enough or too expensive. They didn't invite me to the birthday party. What does that say about me? I'm at work. Now it's my annual review. What's my boss going to say about me? Because everyone's opinion of me defines me. How anxious are you? Man, that's exhausting. Instead, as you live out your faith and as you live out your life, what's your treasure? Is God's opinion of you. You're, You're treasuring the kingdom of heaven. This is why he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. Like you have to change the priority of what you treasure. For our treasure can be so insecure that it produces anxiety. But if we treasure the things of the kingdom of God, where moth cannot destroy and rust cannot destroy, how secure is your treasure? Perfectly secure. How threatened is your treasure? Not at all. How's your anxiety doing? I'm totally fine. I just don't get spun up. I'm not worried. For the one who I trust is the heavenly father, and what I treasure is perfectly secure. It can't be threatened. Which leads to this last question, how do we live today? What what is our thinking of tomorrow? It ends in verse 34, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. In the middle of the book of Lamentations, where Israel is facing this incredible hardship because of a siege on it, in the middle of Lamentations is this beautiful verse, New every morning are your mercies. Great is thy faithfulness. Why are there new mercies every morning? Because there's new trouble every day. (laughs) That's why. Why does God graciously give new, fresh mercies every morning? Is because every day has new troubles. And those morning mercies are to meet the day's troubles. Where we get ourselves spun up is when we try to take tomorrow's troubles, next week's potential troubles, 20 years from now, and bring them all into today. What will happen in 15 years? What will happen in 30 years? Will I have enough to retire? And we bring all of these worries into today, and we overwhelm the mercies of the morning. This is why God, when he led his people through the wilderness, fed them with daily manna. Learn to trust your heavenly father every single day. This is why he teaches us to pray for our daily bread here in Matthew chapter six. Why? So that we don't bring tomorrow's troubles into today. Now, this doesn't mean that you don't plan for things. Like there's, in my mind, I'll give you an example. I'm trying to retire at some point, maybe 70, 75, 90, I don't know. But instead of wondering, like, what's your number? I don't know. Do I have enough? I don't know. What's the trouble for today? Am I willing to set apart a, a portion of my income that will be set apart in a 403B, in a Roth, that will work over time to possibly produce enough for retirement? What's the trouble today? What's the worry? Will I set aside enough of my income to do that today? I'm not, I'm not concerned for 30 years from now. I'm just worried with the troubles today. And now many people are like, I'm on the edge of, in, of retirement and I can't retire tomorrow. Okay. Well, what's the next trouble to face today? 
You can't exhaust new mercies of the morning with bringing in a lifetime of potential perceived troubles. And so what is our attitude about tomorrow? It will worry about itself. Like there's a, there's a whole anxiety machine that's just worrying about itself and I am looking at today's troubles. And so Lord, teach me to see you as my heavenly father present with me, the one who feeds the birds and clothes the lilies and how much more valuable to you am I. Help me to treasure the things of the kingdom that are unshakable and help me to trust you for today, for today. And so whenever my anxieties like spin up, that's my prayer life, is Lord, help me to see who you are and where you are. Help me to treasure you above all these other things and help me to look at today. For tomorrow is not guaranteed to us. We only have today. I'll close with this. This is just a, such an encouragement to me. This comes from 1 Peter chapter 5. It simply says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him. Why? Because he cares for you. That's who your father is, the one who cares for you. Now, don't when you cast him, don't cast him like you do a fishing lure and reel him back in. But like a stone, a weight to say, that's yours. It's not mine to bear. And perhaps, perhaps, over the week of sitting with the Lord and telling him your story of why you're anxious, you might learn to live as carefree as the birds and the lilies. That would be wonderful. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you care for us that you care about us, that you know what our needs are, and that you are present with us. And so, Father God, we ask that you would give us eyes to see you in our life as Elisha's servant saw, as Elisha saw, that we would know that you are with us. Father, help us to tie our hearts to the things of the kingdom that are unshakable, secure, and eternal. And Lord, help us to be present with the troubles of today and not get so spun up about the what ifs, the possibilities, the uncertainties of tomorrow. For tomorrow will take care of itself. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.